America's most enjoyable cigarette presents... Racket Squad. Captain Braddock, ready. What you're about to see is a thrilling, dramatic, real-life story. Taken from the files of the police racket and bunco squads, business protective associations, and similar sources all over the country. It is presented by Philip Morris as a public service to expose the confidence game. The carefully worked out frauds by which confidence men take more money each year from the American public than all the bank robbers and thugs with their violence. This is an amazing case. Amazing in the sense of its scope and take, which actually runs into the billions of dollars. Although it started with pennies and nickels in the slums and poor sections of our larger cities. The gullibility of many of us is astounding because there are still thousands of suckers falling for this racket daily. But let's get into our personal angle of this swindle. We'll call this case, pick a number. A little man named Mervyn Colt came to my office. Come in. I'm Mervyn Colt, and there's something very strange going on. The world is full of strange things, Mr. Colt. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. Now, what seems to be the trouble? I'm assistant chief bookkeeper for the clearinghouse. Been there for 15 years, and it's a good job. Barbecue every summer, pension in five years. Sounds very pleasant, Mr. Colt, but let's get to the point. I take it your trouble has something to do with this job. I'm going to lose it. And maybe I'll also lose my life. I'm listening, Mr. Colt. I feel like a traitor in telling this. Mr. Phillips has been my boss for a little less than a year, but I liked him. I'm an honest man, Captain Braddock, and I had to come to you. One of my duties is to give the press the daily release on the number of stock quotations which have advanced, declined, or remained unchanged during the day's trading. Total tradings and averages. It's a little late. You better release them right away. Yes, Mr. Phillips. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Phillips. These totals are incorrect, according to my figures. Are you insinuating that I have made a mistake? Oh, my, not at all. But neither does my adding machine. Look, Colt, I'm the head of this department. You'll release the figures I gave you. Yes, sir. I was pretty confused, Captain Braddock, because this was the third time this had happened. And then something came over me, and I said to myself, I have to live with myself, so I've got to be honest with myself. So I released the correct figures instead of his. And the results? It was terrible. After the office closed that night, I stopped, as is my habit, for a small beer at Malone's Cafe. I only have one, but it's nice to have some conversation before you go home to your wife. But you did get home. Oh, yes, after I picked up some halibut at the fish market and got the evening paper. Pandora was setting the table when I got there. Good evening, dear. Good evening, Mervyn. Did you bring the fish? Yes, dear. It was 70 cents a pound, and I told that fish man plenty. You must have stopped at Malone's first. I only had two, dear. Well, it's too late to fix it now. We'll have eggs tonight and the fish tomorrow. Yeah. Anything you say, dear.
you want to stay healthy, from now on do as you're told. You know what we mean, chum. Mervyn, what does it mean? I don't know. Maybe it's somebody from Malone's. I know the kind of people that hang out in saloons, and you'll talk to anybody. Now, don't be that way, dear. You know I'm very particular about my friends. Maybe it was intended for someone else's window. Now, maybe you're right, but it came through ours, and new windows cost money. I think you better call the police. If I call the police, they'll make an investigation, and... Well, you can't tell where it would end. Marvin Colt, what are you talking about? Well, I... Answer me, do you hear? I did something dishonest this week. You? A husband and a lodge member? What was it? Now, don't lean over me like that. You're stifling me. Twice. I released false figures on the day's averages at the clearing house. Oh, I thought it was something important. It is, my dear, it is. Then why did you do it? Well, Mr. Phillips, my boss, instructed me to. You mean he deliberately... Well, then there must be a reason. No, I don't know. I... Oh, wait a minute. What is it, my... Today. Today he handed me a set of false figures for release, but this time I ignored them and gave out the correct ones. Mervyn, you, you've got me on pins and needles. What are you talking about? Now I remember. I read about this in the paper. Phillips has tied me into a racket. A terrible racket. The numbers racket. That's what that brick through the window meant. And he was right. Mr. Colt was snagged in one of the worst rackets ever perpetrated. Pile on Red River in the fifth. So I do. What have I got to lose except money? You should not to gamble. From you, that's a funny. What do you do with your lettuce besides fixing basketball games and fights? So what? That ain't a gamble. It's a business. That mug in the flyaway coat always puts onions in these things. I hate onions. So the boss tells us to drink cocktails. So we drink cocktails. Me, I like beer better. Remember the old days in this racket when we were working the south side of town? How can I forget? Hanging around pool rooms and selling numbers for nickels and dimes. Thin shoes, thin overcoat, and thick snow. You can have it, brother. Yeah, writing policy in those days was tough. But the beer was cheap. And look what it led to. Big business. Hello, boys. Hello, Hello boss. boss. Wait for me in the den, honey. Relax. I don't need good manners, bugle calls when I come in. Where have you been? In the policy room. And boss, the tape was... Okay, okay, skip it. Who's interested in dimes and quarters? That's how we started. And dimes and quarters makes dollars, Mr. Cassar. All right, save it. Martinis, huh? Yeah. Well, that's nice stuff if they mix them good and dry. He don't like the onions. Is that so? Well, that reminds me, speaking of underground vegetables. Did you attend to Mr. Colt? The Yanks ought to sign me as a pitcher. The brick went right through the window. And if they could read, they could make out what the note said. It's the termite can destroy the foundation of great structures. That little man cost me a lot of money today by being honest. We could give him laryngitis with a rubber hose. No, I don't think violence is the answer at the moment with Mr. Colt. Phillips needs him in the clearinghouse. But we can scare him. And keep an eye on him. Will do. Okay, boys. Have all the martinis you want. Only lay off the beer. It's got no eight clock. What's an eight clock? Didn't you ever hear of a chocolate eight clock? Oh. Well, that's it. Well, I was wondering when you'd get here. Uh, I'm sorry about today, Mr. Cassava, that dumb little bookkeeper. Sit down, Philip. Sit down. Now, uh, who got you that job in the clearinghouse? Well, you did, sir. Why do you suppose I went to the trouble to do that? Why, so we could control the release of the clearinghouse averages and skip a payoff. Oh, you're dumb, Phillips. You're very dumb. In the numbers racket, the percentage in my favor is a thousand to one, so why should I bother about that? Look, you're supposed to know this. 
But I'm going to explain it to you once again because you're not very bright. Now, have you got a pencil and a piece of paper? I'm going to throw some figures at you at random. You're going to set them down the way the newspapers print clearinghouse averages. Advances, 72. Declines, 480. Unchanged, 290. Now, tell me the payoff number. Well, it's the sum of the last row of numerals reading down. 200. Correct. But it was your job to see to it that phony figures were released, numbers that I knew in advance. Then I sent agents to a rival syndicate, and that rival syndicate shoots the works on that hot number. And they pay me off, too, 500 to 1. Or maybe they try to leave town, have a little accident. So help me, I didn't know what I was handling. Now, when Colt released the correct figures instead of ours, he sent me back 200,000 clams with the Moffat Syndicate just when I had him on the run. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Cassava, but it won't happen again. That, that Colt's a milk toast. I can shove him back into line. Oh, that treatment's already been started with a brick. Now, you see to it that Colt obeys orders, or the little man may find himself swimming underwater with a lead weight in each hand. Yes, Mr. Cassava. Which one of you is Cassava? Who are you? I'm right. Well, now that's where you're wrong. I'm usually right. Waterville's back again. You ought to be in it. My name's Wright. I'm general manager at National Aircraft. Does that mean anything to you? Oh, yes, yes. Well, uh, what can we do for you? I had a tough time finding you, but now that I'm here, I've got a little message for you. There's 15,000 men working in my plant. You've got agents planted there that sell numbers. Now, naturally, my men lose, so you let them ride. And when the local election comes along, you put the pressure on them. They either vote your way or they pay up. Oh, now that's ridiculous. That's a pretty big word coming from a former hood. Now you listen to me. You get your men out of there or we get them out with monkey wrenches. I'm not preaching politics, I'm preaching freedom. Get those bums out. Hey, he's on the level. Well, ain't we all? You know, this has been a very trying day. Here are the day's averages, Colt. It's after four, you better make your release. Yes, Mr. Phillips. Well, is anything wrong? No, Mr. Phillips. I'll make the release right away. Thank you. got your message. I, I guess I know why you wanted to see me. Now, that was quite brilliant of you. Wasn't quite so brilliant of me, though, when I hired you. Well, well, what can you do with a man with a conscience? Conscience has no place in my business. I'm interested only in money from the suckers who think I give them an even break. Now, the numbers racket is the greatest bunco game in the world, but I take no bunco from the people who work it with me. Now, it was your job to see to it that the clerk in the clearinghouse issued the figures I chose. Twice you failed me. It set me back $500,000. That, my friend, doesn't grow on bushes. Now, where's this Mervyn Colt? Well, I, I went to his house tonight, but the little man wasn't there. Maybe he went to the police. Oh, no. He wouldn't have the courage to do that. He's, he's yellow. As yellow as you are? But... But, Cassaba, this isn't my fault. My advice to you, my friend, is to leave town and on a fast bus. He's dishonorable. No ethics. Well, I'm not interested in Mr. Phillips, gentlemen. The one I'm interested in is Mr. Colt. Sure, sure, but where do we find him? All the clothes have gone out of that apartment. Obviously, he's in hiding. He's in hiding because he knows what he's involved in. You'll find him. When you find him, shut him up. Will do. But I don't 
understand. I've done nothing wrong. I'm not a criminal. We know that, Mr. Colt. But you're tied in with as vicious a mob as there is in the country. Now, don't say that, Captain Braddock. You make me afraid and cold inside. I'm just a family man with a small job. Why would they want to do me harm? Well, when you released the correct clearinghouse figures today, you also signed a potential death warrant. You did this under my orders. Now, we've got to take care of you. Yes, I understand. <laughs> That certainly was a roundabout way you had me meet you down one street and up another alley. I'm sorry. We could have met you at the morgue. I see what you mean. Now, would you mind explaining what you intend to do from here on? Well, you and your wife will stay undercover in the spot where we placed you. In the meantime, we'll tail Phillips and try and locate the big wheel of the number syndicate. He's the man we want. Oh, such trouble. Why did I have to get mixed up in it? You're just a small cog and a big machine, Mr. Colt. Now, take it easy. Your wife's waiting for you. Fortune teller told me something like this would happen to us in April. It was a trouble card right over the Black King and next to it the Five of Spades. When I married you, you were a clerk at Hemmels and Company. The biggest cheese company in the country. Look at us now. Why didn't you stay there? Who knows what you'd be now? A big cheese, maybe. Mervyn, listen. I I'm not complaining. You've always been a good provider and a good husband. But I... I'm worried. This number racket, it's a vicious thing. The newspapers and the magazines try to destroy it, but it goes on and on teach thousands of people every day. I know, I know, my dear, but I have nothing to do with that. In fact, in my way, I've tried to destroy it. The only thing you've destroyed is our home. Do you like being cooped up in one room with a policeman outside the front door? I don't know. It makes me feel kind of important. I forgot to send out the laundry and water the geraniums before I left. Well, I paid the gas bill today. What difference does that make? We're not there to cook with it, are we? I had a nice chicken in the icebox, too. I wonder if it's still there. It was dead, wasn't it? Mervyn called. Here we are, practically refugees, and you make fun. Is this what you like? One room and a bed? Isn't there anything else you miss? Yes, dear, Malone's. Malone's, Malone's. I had a home with lovely furniture. Now, now, Pip. <laughs> Nothing is going to happen to our home while we're staying here. <laughs> This is a bottle of beer. That's right. And it's being poured in Malone's Saloon, Mr. Colt's favorite social club. That's right. Mr. Colt is having the beer. He went out the back door of his hideaway because we told him to. We want the men who want him. Where have you been? I haven't seen you around. Things have been happening, Mike. A lot of things. Oh, you ain't plan on throwing your hat into the elections, are you? Now, don't be silly, Mike. I'm working with the law. Oh, this needs a little explaining. Yes, I... I shouldn't be out right now. And I agree with you. No, no, you don't understand. I'm key man in the biggest racket scandal in this town. Of course, I can't give you any details, but Mike, it's the hottest thing in town. I've got a brother-in-law who's a cop in Cincinnati. Maybe he could help you. This has nothing to do with Cincinnati. I certainly it has. It's the biggest racket in the country. Uh, that last beer is on me. Uh, I think you'd better go home now. Home? I can't. I... Oh. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm talking too much. <sighs> okay, Mike. I'll let you know how things turn out. Yeah, you, you do that. The train was coming around the bend of the mountain 
and black smoke bellowed from its stack. Toot, toot, clang, clang. The sound echoed through the canyon, and Black Tom and his men sat their horses in silence at the far end of the trestle. Dynamite was wired under that trestle, and there was a million dollars in the mail car. Black Tom was waiting for the explosion. <clears throat> Pardon me, boss. What's the idea interrupting? Can't you see I'm reading the peaches? Can't she read? Sure, she can read. Only she likes the way I do it better. Well, I got news for you, Mr. Cassava. We found Mervyn Colt. Mervyn Colt? And know where he's living. Well, let's go see Mervyn Colt. I'm awfully nervous, Mother. Awfully nervous. Now, you just do what Mr. Braddock told you to do. I'm going down to the drugstore to get a mustard plaster for my lumbago. Yes, dear. is right. Well, we finally found you, Mr. Colt. Do you know that you've cost me $500,000? Who, who are you? Never mind the name. I run the numbers racket in this city. And you are part of it. You and Phillips until you got smart and tried to cross us up. I knew those numbers Phillips gave me were phony. I couldn't be dishonest. Neither can I, so I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to kill you. Hold it. You're very obliging, Mr. Cassaba. I've heard all I need to take you downtown. Jim, I think you better send for the wagon for Mr. Cassaba and company. I'm sorry, Mr. Colt, if they roughed you up a bit. Oh, that's all right, Captain Braddock. And now, if you don't mind, I think I'll go down to Malone's. It's been a trying night. Yes, it has. <laughs> Mr. Cassava and his friends, Lemon, Balkan, and Phillips, aren't selling numbers anymore. They're wearing them at the state penitentiary. Unfortunately, we haven't broken the numbers racket. Granted, we've severed one tentacle of this octopus, but the rest of its arms still cling to a great number of our cities. It's as mean and vicious and dishonest a racket as we know, and it will continue as long as the gullible believe they can beat it. Well, they can't. It's crooked from its inception. Just plain, unadulterated bunco. Remember, if you have a dollar and want to multiply it, invest it. Don't pick a number, because the taker has yours before you start. And it can happen to you. Remember this. You can smoke for pleasure today. No cigarette hangover tomorrow. That is the big advantage you enjoy in Philip Morris. Remember, Philip Morris is made differently from any other leading brand. And that difference is your guarantee of everything you've ever wanted in a cigarette. Tasty mildness, rich flavor, pleasant aroma, a clean, refreshing smoke, and no cigarette hangover. So... You'll be glad tomorrow you smoked Philip Morris today. All names and places in tonight's story have been changed for obvious reasons. And any resemblance to other people and places is purely coincidental. Our story is presented to expose the confidence game and is never intended to reflect in any way upon honest, legitimate businessmen.